glad to be here after seven years. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, my pleasure. So um, I'm going to talk about surgical prophylaxis. So uh, there's this. Try tapping inside of the windows. Yeah, yep, and you should be able to use the this one. Click inside the window first. Uh, yeah, just okay. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Right. Okay. So surgical site infections um, usually are defined as like related to the operative procedures near the surgical incision, and usually defined within like 30 or 90 days of the procedure. That's what you call them, surgical site infections. And usually they're around the incision site. Sometimes they can be obviously um, in the organs, they can be deeper, but mostly um, incision site, surgical, they're called surgical site infections. And they're most common and they're very costly healthcare associated infections. And uh, they count about 38% of the nosocomial infections. So that's that. And then how do you define them? It's usually one or more of these following. You see a, a purulent exudate coming out of the surgical site. You have a fluid culture that's positive from a surgical site, or there's a dehesed wound from the sur surgery, or and there's one one often one sign of infection like pain or swelling or erythema or warmth. And if a surgeon makes the diagnosis that it's infected, which is pretty. So two classifications, uh, incisional and um, so mostly like superficial or deeper. The deeper are the organs. Uh, you can say like if you get medias mediastinitis from um, right after a cabbage, that would you would define that as a deep uh, surgical site infection. And then uh, you can classify the wounds into four different types mainly. The clean, clean contaminated, contaminated and dirty. So we'll just go over the the rates of the surgical site infections com, um, re correlation to these wound classes. So the clean wounds usually they they, com, they are usually 1.33 percent of the total wounds that we see with the surgical site infections. Clean contaminated, as you can see, is more than that. Contaminated about 15 percent, and then dirty wounds are usually about 40 percent, up to 40 percent. So the clean wound, um, no inflammation, uh, usually associated with like primary closure of wound, and there's no um, deeper, um, you know, entrance during the procedure in the into the viscous. That's the clean wound. The clean contaminated, it's usually the they have entered some kind of viscous, but there's no contamination from the viscous to the to the incision site. Uh, contaminated wounds are usually your, um, the, there's like major breaks in the sterile techniques in during surgery. There's like a spillage from the viscous or there's like a non purulent inflammation that has occurred. So those are your contaminated wounds. Your dirty wounds are usually the ones that have retained foreign bodies, fecal contamination from peritonitis, perforated viscous, stuff like that. So those are your dirty wounds. Uh, microbiology with clean wounds, usually it's your skin flora, strep staph aureus, MSSA, uh, coag negative staph. Uh, clean contaminated uh, includes the gram negative rods and enterococcus as well. And then dirty wounds are all poly polymicrobial, so you can see all sorts of gamut with that. Um, why do we do antimicrobial prophylaxis? The main goal is to reduce the burden of organisms during surgery and to prevent that. The timing of the prophylactic um, antibiotics and uh, like how did they define that is like early, early, uh, early, prof early prophylactic antibiotic is defined as like within two to 24 hours before the incision is made. Pre-op is about zero to two hours before the incision. Peri-op is about three hours and then post-op is more than three hours after the incision. So those are kind of like the the timing guidelines on, but most uh, most studies have shown that well, the, the best outcomes are when you give them during the pre-op period, which is about zero to two hours before the incision, which is what we typically do. 
so pre-op prophylaxis usually recommended for like immunocompromised patients, uh, cardiac surgeries, foreign device. There's other criteria for that, but mo- but a lot of the times, for for sure, you should use the pre-op prophylaxis with these patients. Uh, and a microbial agent, how you choose, it's usually it depends on the 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 type of pathogens that are most likely to contaminate your surgery site. You have to use some proper dose, proper time, and then um, shortest effective period. The shortest period that can minimize like the adverse effects, and also you have to keep in mind the emergence of resistance and the cost. So um, mostly the risk factors for patients who uh, typically are uh, doing better with the pros, uh, pre-op prophylaxis or antimicrobial prophylaxis, Patients who are extremes of age, too young, too old, poor nutritional status, majority of your LTAC patients, obesity, um, diabetes, of course, smoking, immunosuppression of any kind, steroid use, any recent surgeries that they had, and um, the length of their pre-op hospitalization prior to the surgery, as well as known colonization with resistant bacteria. So those are your risk factors that have poor outcomes if you don't give them the pre-op prophylaxis. Mostly what it does, it prevents the morbidity mortality, reduces the cost of your healthcare, minimal adverse effects, and then uh, also adverse, uh, minimal adverse effects for microbial flora of patient or hospital. How do you select the antibiotics? Usually the cost, safety, pharmacokinetic profile, and their antimicrobial activity. Each type of surgery has different kind of bacteria that you're dealing with, so you want to target, um, you want to have different antibi- antibiotics to use with those. So usually ANCEF is your drug of choice um, with uh, with majority of the surgeries that you're going to see. And um, why, why ANCEF is because the duration of action, um, usually about eight hours uh, post-op, the spectrum of activity most commonly that you encounter like coag negative staph, staph aureus, and stuff works well with that. Uh, it has excellent safety profile and obviously it's low cost. So those are the those are the reasons why we use NSF so much pre-op prophylaxis. And the other antibiotics that we use for uh, pre-op is uh, cefuroxime and then cefoxetin and cefotetan that has more anaerobic activity, so you could use that instead of unison or uh, zosin, which is too broad spectrum, but those have some anaerobic activity that you can use with, uh, we'll see later on, like with the GI surgeries and your other kind of surgeries where anaerobes are playing a primary role. So no rule for no role for vancomycin routinely. Uh, if you see that, usually uh, it's 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 with patients who have high risk for MRSA. We'll go over in the next few slides when when it is appropriate to use vancomycin. But uh, why they don't use vancomycin routinely? It's because it's been associated with more post-op skin and soft tissue infections in or surgical side infections in patients, especially if they were negative for MRSA. So they 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 recommend not to use vancomycin routinely, except if they have had the history of MRSA infections, they have MRSA colonization, you can check their MRSA nares, or if they have high risk for MRSA colonization. Uh, what are your, can can you guys name some of the high risk for MRSA population? Or what would they be? Can you guys name some? Heavy drug users. They could be, yep. People in the ICU for a long time. Great, current yep. Hospitalization. Current hospitalization, what else? Nursing, Nursing homes, great. Um, your HD patients, um, they are very high risk for MRSA, and uh, immunosuppressed patients, they are they're also high risk for MRSA colonization. So, then um, Vanco, they have studied that it's been less effective than ANSEF for MSSA in particular, so they recommend not to use it. And uh, usually, certain certain scenarios you can use Vanco and ANSEF, and I see that in my acute hospitals where I go to, but it's very, usually it's ANSEF that the surgeons pick. Uh, Vanco single dose is acceptable because it has a very long um, half-life. Does anybody know what the Vanco half-life is? Uh, 
just a wild guess. 48 hours. About six hours. <laughs> 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 That's all good. Long and surgical. <laughs> in terms of short surgery, short, you know, procedures and whatnot. What about NSEF? Does anybody know NSEF half-life? I think it's shorter because they have to dose every three hours, hours or something. So about two hours. Yep, that's correct. But it's precisely 1.8 hours, but yeah, two hours. Great. So usually NSEF dose, just use like two grams. Um, you should do that. And then uh, three grams if a patient is over 120 kilos. That's like more than probably 300 pounds calculating probably 400. So um, what about GENT? You could, they studied that five milligrams per kilogram time one dose was better than dosing GENT over like eight hours, like that kind of dosing. So they studied that that dosing was uh, good enough rather than keep dosing it every eight hours. In obese patients, you can, I, I never honestly use it in my acute hospitals. It's usually a pharmacy consult. So, but you can, if you want to know for all practical purposes, that's what you use 20% above ideal, ideal body weight. I'm not sure if they ever test this on boards, but just thought I could put it here. With the timing of the, when do you give the antibiotics before incision? It's usually 60 minutes. And they did some studies where there was really no difference if you gave them 30 minutes before incision or 60 minutes. So 60 minutes has been kind of like the ideal uh, in uh, time for prior to surgical incision. If you're using vancomycin or fluoroquinolone, uh, usually you want to use that, um, you want to give that 120 um, minutes before the surgical incision. Can anybody guess why? The infusion, exactly. Mm -hmm. So they have a prolonged infusion for both the drugs. And then, um, so that's why you want to give them 100 and like about two hours before their surgical incision, both the fluoroquinolones and vancomycin. So uh, repeat dosing, like do you need to give more than one dose after the incision? You typically know, and they did a study where they found that there was no difference. Um, there was not a, a huge, like a in huge systemic review of randomized trials they did, there was not a significant difference in the rate of surgical site infections if you gave single dose versus you gave multiple dose um, for less than 24 hours. Now, obviously, there's some uh, exceptions where you should do that if the procedure that, that they're going for exceeds the two half-lives of the drug or there's like a lot of blood loss intra-op and there's uh, burns there's extensive burns. If you're going to burn unit, they should typically get more than one dose uh, uh, pre-op or they should continue after the surgery. So during uh, duration of the pre-op prophylaxis, the repeat dosing usually not recommended, but as I said in the prior um, slide, like if, if these, are the, these are the scenarios where you would typically be okay using more than one dosing. And usually it should not exceed 24 hours post-surgery, the reason being obviously C. diff and acute kidney injury. And those are like really um, big, big issues with using uh, antibiotic prophylaxis post 24 hours after surgery. So we'll go over some, uh, some guidelines for the different types of surgeries and uh, so cardiac surgery, they define like, like the cabbage, your valve procedures, or any kind of device placements. So your AICDs, pacemakers, resynchronization. Um, the, the most common organisms with the cardiac surgery, you'll see your staph aureus two-thirds of the time, coag negative staph, and then P. acnes, which is now called QT, QT bacterium, acnes. And then less common, you'll see gram negatives, uh, pseudomonas, and sometimes acinetobacter as well. For cardiac surgeries, they still recommend NSEF over cefuroxime, uh, vancomycin only if they're MRSA colonized, and then if they have any kind of beta-lactam allergies, you can use vanco or clinda, uh, along with aminoglycoside like GENT or estrionam or fluoroquinolone. It just depends like what kind of population you're dealing with in cardiac surgery. And if, especially with the uh, graph, this, uh, the saphenous venous graphs, they recommend uh, using a gram negative coverage because they're more associated with 
gram negatives um, infections. So they recommend using that for those surgeries. Uh, with the uh, duration, really it didn't show that if you use them beyond one to four days of, of their actual surgery, it didn't really show any reduction in the surgical side infections, and there's no benefit in extending them pending their removal of their drains or their lines or catheters or anything like that. So more side effects than benefits, basically. Apologize for the typos. Um, and they also did a staph aureus vaccine. It was called V710, which did not really, they were giving it to patients preoperatively in cardiac surgeries, and it did not really reduce any rates of their post-op staph infections. And uh, I cannot find the reason why there was increased mortality, but they, they did not have any benefit to using that vaccine. That was interesting that they had even a vaccine for that. So that's like a table form of like, um, just a snapshot of like the procedures and you, you would use like ANSAF or cifuroxime and then Vinco if they are MRSA colonized and if they have uh, and if they have like a, a beta lactam allergy then you could go with Clinda. IV Clinda is on a shortage in a lot of the hospitals. I'm not sure how it, how it is with Tampa General but we're having a hard time yeah, at Baker. Shortage of the Yeah. Um, Particularly certain certain files, certain doses, like you weren't able to get the 600. Yep. I'm not sure. We'll have to check. Oh. Yeah, in Bay Care hospitals where I primarily go, they 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 don't have like there's a we had a neck fash patient and it was like we had to use Zyvox, and you know instead of Clinda, so it was kind of whatever. So uh, device placement, as I said, permanent pacemakers, AICD, and your cardiac resync devices. So before the patients have those devices placed, you can give them a dose of NSF prior to device implantation, and they they saw that the, there was a significantly lower rate of surgical site infections with those patients in particular. So risk factors for device-related infections, I thought that was uh, important to just kind of point it out here. Uh, if they have had fevers within 24 hours before they're getting in a device implanted, they were more at risk for device-related infection, would try to avoid it if possible. If they got temporary pacing before the implantation, they were at more higher risk for getting infection. And um, if they had some kind of, if they developed a pocket hematoma, or they are getting more than two leads placed. And then if there was a steroid use more than one month in the year prior to their implantation, that puts them at more risk for device-related infections. Uh, thoracic surgeries, about lumectomy, pneumonectomy, your VATS procedures, lung resections, all that stuff. Same, pretty much same guidelines, uh, but um, the infections in thoracic surgery, you tend to see like surgical side infections, pneumonias, and empyemas. And uh, with uh, surgical side infections with thoracic surgeries, you tend to see more staph and staph epi. Pneumonia is gram positives, gram negatives, and also fungal. So keep that in mind. I just couldn't really find a whole lot, but they were saying that fungal, the candida was like more, more, um, uh, more prevalent with the pneumonia part. Yeah, I, I couldn't really find a lot of, we don't typically use like fungal, usually colonizer, but um, they, they recommend it and uh, mostly in up to date. That was interesting. So thoracic surgery, ANSEF is reasonable. Obviously vancomycin if they're colonized with MRSA, same stuff like cardiac surgeries. And that's another chart, same stuff. You could use unison if you're concerned that there's gonna be some kind of like uh, anaerobic or any gram negative that you're worried about covering with unison. Otherwise, uh, NSF should be sufficient for those situations. Vascular surgery, uh, not a whole lot. Same kind of like guidelines with the surgeries involving groin incisions or your amputations, ischemia, stuff like that. With GI surgeries, um, mostly the your um, the vagotomies, vig they are like the gastroduodenal procedures, you typically you can get away with using just ANSEF. With biliary tract, you wanna kinda add um, an anaerobic coverage 
and but they, they, they a lot of them just recommended ANSEF, but you could as you see you could use like the cefotitan and the cefoxetin which is sorry um which is like you could use that or unison for that matter or you could use flagyl add flagyl to the ANSEF or androcephin for elective lab coles they they recommend no prophylaxis but a lot of surgeons end up doing that in real practice and then cholangitis absolutely you want to use your uh, prophylaxis in, uh, you should be using like unison or safin flagyl and flagyl with appendectomies um, uncomplicated appendectomies like if there's the, the, the appendix is inflamed but there's only um, there's no like peritonitis or there's no perforation or gangrene uh, and safin flagyl a pre-op is just fine. You don't need to continue it past the procedure. But if there is like a perforation or gangrene intra-op, then you want to continue the antibiotics for about five days post-op. But obviously the duration can depend on like the clinical scenario and the bacteria and all that stuff. Pancreatic procedures, um, typically you, you should I'm use like- Always tied to comfortability, functionality, easeability. Um, and is it interchangeable? Is it something that can ease? Oh. Uh, <laughs> for small intestine procedures, um, ANSEF should be good, but you can add anaerobic coverage if there is any obstruction with the uh, um, small intestine obstruction. You can you can use um, anaero anaerobic okay. coverage. Colorectal procedures, um, obviously you need your anaerobic coverage, so typically tend to use ANSEF and flagyl or cefotitan, cefoxetin, stuff like that. So quick question. Um, this was actually a, a board review question. So uh, somebody wants to read it or? 22 year old previously healthy male in the emergency room with a 24 hour history of right lower quadrant pain, nausea, vomiting, low grade fever, white blood cell count of 15,000. CT diagnosis a non-perforated appendicitis surgeon, excises an inflamed but non-perforated appendix at laparoscopic surgery, patient is not known to be colonized with any special pathogen, had no allergies. What's the optimal recommendation for antibiotic therapy? Yeah, what do you guys think? The first choice should be ANSEF and flagyl, but um, but just just read like what we just talked about: uncomplicated, non-perforated appendicitis. What would you do? Um, so you wouldn't, yeah, the appendix is out, so you wouldn't need for 48 hours afterwards. So the first choice should say ANSEF and flagyl. If that changes, yeah. So number one, right? Okay. Yeah, so the rest of the choices are kind of like telling you that do the pre-op, but then continue 48 hours afterwards, which we just found that, which we just learned that uncomplicated appendicitis, even if it's inflamed intra-op, just um, don't don't worry, like just continue, just do the one pre-op dose and you should be good. And typically you should do ANSEF and flagyl for those or, or unison or any kind of uh, anaerobic coverage. So for GU surgeries, usually when they go for prostate biopsies and stuff like that, um, in complicated patients, oral fluoroquinolone, uh, an hour prior to the prostate biopsy, or you could use Gent and Rosafin or Estrionam if they are allergic to penicillin, so severe allergies. With um, okay, with cystoscopy, they don't really recommend unless they are high risk for developing. They have had some history of like bacteremias in the past related to cystoscopies, then they recommend using Cipro or Bactrim, but it all depends on the your hospital, like the antibiogram and what resistance patterns you're seeing with the E. coli and stuff. So Bactrim may not be the best choice for those, some of those E. coli in some hospitals. For OBGYN um, surgeries, hysterectomies, uh, you could do just ANSEF or or you could use flagyl. It's, it's plus or minus. There was no clear guidelines on that. And um, C-sections, -se technically, um, you, you just get away with doing ANSEF, and you should do a dose of azithromycin for labor or ruptured membranes. Anybody knows why? Yeah. 
the azithromycin use? That would be for your yes. chlamydia, right? Yeah. And uterine evacuation doxy, they recommend. So like any kind of like DNC, abortions, um, stuff like that. So uh, neurosurgery, surgeries, um, clean craniotomies, CSF shunts, or your intrathecal pump placements. The most common bacteria are Staph aureus, Staph epi, P. acnes, and then um, gram negatives or cutie bacterium. So ANCEF single dose is fine if they have beta lactam allergy, vinc or clinda. Orthopedic surgeries. Um, spinal procedures, your hip repairs, your fractures, when they're going for a hardware placement, your total joints. So usually, and then they recommend, they highly recommend prophylaxis prior to removing any kind of ortho hardware, because they found that there was a lot of like um, complications following hardware removal if they weren't given the pre-op prophylaxis, pre-surgical. So, uh, most of the times, orthopedic surgeries are uh, associated with staph aureus and staph epi or beta strap. And then staph aureus and staph epi have the biofilms that they, they form. Um, these are like brief guidelines on like the orthopedic surgeries. If they have a clean operation with no like foreign bodies or no fancy stuff going on, then no antibiotics are recommended. Other procedures, they recommend NSF pre-op. Spinal surgeries are your fusions, laminectomies, and your disc procedures. So usually with spinal surgeries, very high morbidity with surgical side infections um, after the spinal procedure. So they really want you to give the pre-op prophylaxis. Risk factors for SSI after spinal procedures are like your stage procedures, your, if there's like a, a combined anterior posterior fusion, there's like a long surgery, typically more than five hours, but they say two to five hours, and foreign body placement, any kind of hardware placement. They, are they tend to be at risk factors for, risk for uh, developing SSIs. And then ANCEF is reasonable. You could do just vinc or clinda if they have any kind of beta lactam allergies. Breast surgeries, if they're going for just the uh, breast reductions, they typically don't recommend um, any kind of like pre-op prophylaxis. With mastectomies and lymph node dissections, usually with the malignancies, they recommend ANCEF and then beta lactam allergies, you go with vinco or clinda. So right here you can see like if it's a reduction mammoplasty or lumpectomy, like prophylactic mastectomy, they usually don't recommend um, your uh, pre-op prophylaxis. But obviously it depends um, on each patient scenario, but typically that's what they got the guidelines are saying. And that's about it. Any 